Well, thank you all so much. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, Olivia, thank you for the kind welcome. I'm going to do the horrifying full screen share, uh, mainly because I think there's a lot and I want to make sure to easily be able to share with everyone. Um, a couple of things, and, and again, thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. For those of you who aren't familiar with, of course, there we go. For those of you kind of not familiar with Alliance for Peacebuilding, what I wanted to do was show a couple information in terms of what Alliance for Peacebuilding does, what our l &E, our learning evaluation portfolio focuses on, a bit on our interreligious program, the Effective Interreligious Action and Peacebuilding Program, and then two initiatives that we're currently focused on right now that I think have relevance both in terms of the JLI case study, but also ways that we would love to engage with all of you. So first of all, Alliance for Peacebuilding, for those, again, who maybe aren't familiar with us, we're a network organization. We have a bit over 120 member organizations really working throughout 153 countries in the world that involve both very small grass groups, local organizations, up to very large organizations like Mercy Corps and Search for Common Ground. Realistically, um, we try and bridge a divide between just international NGOs, local NGOs, academics, humanitarian development, faith-based groups to really provide a platform from which to bring people together to share current knowledge and then also to actively both for policy and advocacy work with U.S. and European donors and uh, legislative bodies. And then one of our main areas is building these coalitions around strategy and policy across our three main areas, which involve policy and advocacy, learning evaluation, and then our broader partnerships and campaigns. In terms of learning and evaluation at Alliance for Peacebuilding, we divided this more or less into three objective areas. One, we're very focused on improving design monitoring and evaluation capacity we've really focused internally on actual internal development because we've seen that lack of capacity in dm &E really inhibits both foundational um, applications for, for, um, for fundraising as well as in terms of just kind of disallowing individual participation across networks. If, if I, as a small local organization, am incapable of discussing dm &E, I'm more than likely shut out of certain um, funding opportunities, as well as engagement with different types of organizations, donors, legislators, et cetera. So we see this as a huge way to improve an ability to interact across all levels because it's somewhat of a shared language. Although I'm sure all of us are familiar, it's its own kind of <laughs> complicated language. I, I always gave the joke that while I speak fluent French, when I first moved to Burkina Faso, learning how to speak l and &E in French was a totally different experience than being able to discuss, you know, regular life uh, aspects with individuals. So two areas that fall in our internal dm &E capacity building, one is our effective interreligious action and peace building program, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And the second is a major initiative, the Irene Peace Building Database. And I'll also share a bit more information on this project forthcoming. The other area that we work on here is on shared learning. We really believe that while results and findings are absolutely critical to advancing the field and sharing a, a, creating a shared evidence base, we also know that in such a developing field, the process and the methods can be just as important as the end results. So how do we create environments where individuals can share both failures and successes of what they've learned on implementing dm &E across a variety of programs? So one of our main areas for that is our m and &E Solutions Forum, which a couple of you who are on here have participated in in the past. And it's held every year. We're considering this year doing a bit more of a longer digital version. So I'll definitely make sure to share information as that becomes possible. We also last year hosted our first Insights Forum, which was focused on interreligious engagement, particularly in the preventing and countering violent extremism space that we co-hosted with the Tony Blair Institute in Nairobi, Kenya which was an amazing opportunity to engage both with local as well as interreligious actors who are doing this work. And we brought in quite a few donors as well as policymakers to help them engage in a different environment and share what they're learning. And then we also hold our annual conference called PeaceCon every year. This covers the whole gamut of peace building issues, not just l and &E. And then our third area we work very hard on is in synthesizing impact and what I consider translating evidence. We have learned more and more that just good evidence does not affect change. 
And we're trying to understand how we can better translate these critical findings so that individuals can not only receive but affect change as a result of those within their programs and programmatic structures. So two of the areas that we've worked really hard on is our Creativity in Crisis video series, which again, I'll be sharing a little bit more information on. And then we're also conducting field-wide systematic scoping reviews, which allow us to analyze both the theories of change, the programmatic approaches, and the different types of activities associated across different sectors. To date, we've completed a PCVE, um, a violence reduction, a reconciliation one in, a, in alignment with CDA collaborative learning and are looking across a variety of other subsectors, including mental health and trauma, uh, environmental peace building and dialogue programming. So in terms of our actual effective interreligious peace building and action program or EIAP, I know that we all love our acronyms. <laughs> um, this is actually the second iteration of this program. We were very uh, incredibly <laughs> touched to be able to be supported by GHR Foundation in the first iteration that was really trying to understand what does dm &E look like in an interreligious sphere. And I'll share with you some of the, the major result that came out of that, which is a Faith Matters guide that looks at actual implementation of dm &E within this sphere. In the second iteration, what we're trying to work more on is improving internal capacity and providing these connections or these spaces for shared learning, peer learning communities, um, creating, as I said, these opportunities to really look at both successes and failures. I will show you a little more on the Faith Matters Guide, which came out of the, the first iteration. The other major area under improving dm &E capacity that we focused on is our peace building design and monitoring training. This is a five day intensive training. We've conducted it to date with more than 200 participants in six countries across nine trainings. And this training really focuses on kind of the down and dirty foundational, what does it mean to conduct effective design and monitoring? Obviously you can see evaluation is not included. And that was very mindful in the sense, if we're not doing effective design and monitoring, it's very, well, let's just say nearly impossible to do effective evaluation of a program. So our approach has truly been on creating a foundation where programs are collecting data, they're starting to do some comparative analytics, and they're really starting to understand the trends and what they're seeing across their programs so that they're in a better position than then to start completing um, effective evaluation. So it covers uh, five main topics including looking at religion as a form of identity and understanding that implication, that foundational, what does this mean for monitoring evaluation? How do we consider that? How is it a part of? Um, it looks at effective design through our fun and games and logs frames model. <laughs> we then go into indicator design, data collection approaches, including um, best survey design approach uh, practices, as well as qualitative guide creation. And then our final area where we spend actually two days on is data analysis. That involves both quantitative, a bit more heavily than qualitative, but we also go through quite a bit of qualitative tools, both free online tools, as well as basic training on how you could start to analyze qualitative data. So it's a really fun training. So we've done this in many countries now. Um, I've provided a bit.ly link here for you that I'll, I'm sure we will share this out at the end as well, but you can see in the past year, some of what we've done and learned and also some feedback from, from participants. It's something that we offer um, and do do sometimes with specific organizations if they're looking to, to work with an outside organization in that regard and are still looking for additional opportunities to continue the training. It is an in-person training, which we've really considered, what does that mean right now in, in the post-COVID world? And it's something that I'll be honest with you that we're struggling on because a lot of our learning approaches have been very hands-on and have felt that that's a critical component of learning, particularly when you're dealing with complex topics like design, monitoring, and evaluation. But as I said, we're, I think we're all struggling with that. Um, but something we're really committed to trying to figure out, is this something we turn into a digital training? What would that look like? How would it have to change? And then again, under the building connections, we have our events like PeaceCon and the Insights Forum. So the Faith Matters Guide, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, came out under the first EIAP program. I, I saw that Ms. Guerra was joining us, who is very instrumental in the design of this guide. Um, what this covers realistically is both what are distinctive considerations for M&E and interreligious peace building? What is different in this context? 
Um, I come at evaluation as an economist, so I think of this as almost an added constraint in the sense it's something different and we have to really be aware and conscious of what the implications of interreligious peace building are towards m and &E. It then looks at design and monitoring of both programs, how you could prepare for an evaluation, and then how you could start to implement an evaluation. It was field tested across seven different organizations in multiple countries to help us get this into a development state. And I'll also share the link for where this can be accessed. <clears throat> so in cases of interest, this is a free document for anyone who would be interested in, in reviewing it. One of the kind of final two areas that I'd like to talk a little bit about is in reference to two of our current initiatives. One is the Irene Peacebuilding Database. This database was basically the culmination of over two years of work to really understand and assess how indicators are being created and used across the peacebuilding field. So it is a full database that encompasses approaches, indicators, and measures that are currently being used to evaluate success in the field writ large. It is not a quality assessment of those indicators, but the reason behind why this was so important to us is we see this one as a starting point for program design. I have, a, when I do a lot of trainings with individuals who are just starting, you know, foundationally understand DME, indicators are such a horrifying concept and often they're just copied and pasted. So really starting to understand how could you begin a conversation around good measurement and particularly contextually relevant measurement is I think really had to start from, well, how is the peace building field writ large trying to measure these very intangible concepts? It also can serve as an inspiration when you're working on this m and &E framework and creating programmatic indicators. I always tell people it's easier to critique than to create. So sometimes being able to see how others are measuring in topics like um, interreligious tolerance or social cohesion or questions of trust doesn't mean that it's a perfect cookie cutter, what they did, I'm gonna do, but it really can start to serve as inspiration as you start to consider what would be contextually relevant for your own work. And the third, as I said, this is not a quality indication of what the indicators are. It is a comprehensive database. There are, we reviewed over 2008 peace building evaluation resources and the database holds over 3,381 indicators across the field divided into seven peace building outcomes that were derived from the indicators. We didn't put them into place. So we see this as the first step in starting to define key indicators for the peace building field and potentially seek some standardization. It doesn't mean that that's possible and it doesn't mean that we're saying here it is, but it's a way for us to start that analysis. So I wanted to give you all a little bit of a peek into what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Irene. As I said, this is also a, a free tool um, the seven program areas that it looks at, particularly peace building outcomes, are dispute resolution, governance, perceptions of safety and security, resilience, social cohesion, trust, and violence reduction. It has a full instruction sheet for individuals who are not as familiar with Excel on how to use. It has the full database, but then a couple of the areas that we worked really hard on is thinking through how individuals could use or search for shared indicators. One is geographical scope. You may be interested in understanding how individuals in a specific country, maybe Pakistan, are measuring peace building outcomes. So you could search by a country. We also spent a lot of time working on tags. And this is where interreligious kind of components can really play a big role. Because this is where we may be looking at things like how GBV was being measured or questions of negotiation or leadership trainings, if we're trying to understand how individuals have mimicked type of programmatic approaches we were interested in. It also captures full data on target groups, what a program or with whom a program was attempting to work so that you could potentially look at leadership trainings amongst youth in Nigeria, because you wanna understand as a good basis of summary, what is going on in that context in a region, maybe you're designing a program. It also, within each of the individual areas, one second, has area subgroups. So we recognize that dispute resolution in and of itself is a huge topic. It could involve accessibility of DR mechanisms, prevalence of communities, utilizing peaceful dispute resolution. There's a lot of other components that play a role in dispute resolution. And then the final area that's really important to us is it provides you with the entire source content so that you can actually look at the original source if it's of interest to you. So just to give you an example, the full database, as I said, allows you to search across these areas. And then it also provides critical information like what was this program actually about? 
Um, what does this look like? What were they attempting to do? And then it provides you with the actual indicator that they used, and then very importantly, the specific measure. So I know the one I picked had a lot of NAs, which is a problem in and of itself, but let's say, let's go back to that question I had raised about Nigeria. Maybe we wanted to see about programs happening in Nigeria. I'm just gonna filter by Nigeria. And I wanted to look at target groups with youth. So what it's gonna do then is provide me with any resource that targeted youth in Nigeria and the available indicators therein. So I could look at an example here, I just picked it at random. The indicator was level of participation within the community. But what's really important is we capture the measure. How did they actually assess <laughs> that indicator? So in this case, they asked a question via a survey. I participate regularly in community activities such as town hall meetings, projects, programs, et cetera. We provide you with the measure options and then also how they calculated it. In this case, they looked at both those who said very true and true, which obviously has a different result than if you had just looked at very true or maybe just at true. So this is a major kind of engagement that we've been working on across the field. And one of the things that we're looking on now is expanding this outside of an Excel form into a digital, uh, into a digital form of a database that not only could be more easily accessible because we recognize that Excel can have a barrier to entry for many individuals, but also would have a participatory approach where individuals can recommend other indicators and measures that they're using. And we see this as so critical to this conversation because many local organizations in particular do not publish their results. So we don't have access to their indicators or the ways that they're measuring. And we think that that is a critical component. And just as importantly, we also want to be able to provide a space for comments. I always give the example, um, we were testing a couple of indicators and tools under another project with Mercy Corps, and they had a question for a long time, a willingness to marry someone of an opposing religion. And they consistently were getting very, very high percentages. And like, wow, these are really tolerant communities when it comes to interreligious tensions. And when they actually did some qualitative research on why individuals were responding so affirmatively to this, in many instances, they were saying they were willing to marry someone of another religion because they wanted to convert them. Well, we can recognize that that probably is not a good indicator of interreligious tolerance at all, but that information tends to be very closed in the sense it rests with only certain individuals and isn't translated up. So you see a lot of organizations duplicating those same types of indicators. So we see the comments as well as the additions as a critical component to expand this out. So this is a free resource. It's available currently for download um, that I also, as I said, will share the links on. So that's the Irene Peace Building database. And then the final area that I'm really excited to speak with all of you about is our Creativity in Crisis video series. This is an initiative that we started implementing post COVID, but had already been in the work in terms of an alternative measure for sharing findings, research and evidence to the field. Um, really allowing us to highlight innovative and creative solutions to basically shared challenges that we're seeing. Today, we've only produced three, um, although to be fair, that's one per month. <laughs> but we're looking to expand this really rapidly. And one of the areas that we're really intrigued in while Olivia and I first started speaking was in reference to the case studies. But we'd really like to highlight the amazing work that's being done by implementing organizations and how they're addressing challenges that they face in the field. Um, on one of the previous meal hubs, one of the examples was a bot, uh, a chat bot that was being introduced to help with food distribution through an interreligious network. That's such a perfect example of a way that we're addressing the challenge. We don't have access perhaps to good information on where we have food insecurity and we're trying to harness or leverage a new technology to get that information in a different way. So to date, we've, um, we've provided three. One is on rapid emergency response surveys, which is a mobile phone type surveying approach. Again, these are not perfect replicas that we're saying everyone should just go out and do. What we wanna provide is ways individuals have addressed these challenges in their own environments and also ways that they're not or have not been successful. We also looked at two different approaches on how you could create a data sample in the sense if you were trying to do remote data sampling, because now let's be honest, most of our programs are handling remote management where we may not be on the um, in the field or even within our field teams or our local organizations, they have massive hindrances and barriers to move about as well. So what does that mean in terms of our research? 
forthcoming, we're working on a multi video series on GIS and remote sensing with a variety of organizations who are implementing that some through free technologies and th some through um, subscription base. So I also can provide a link to these videos, but we're really intrigued, as I said, to work with individual participants, particularly in the faith-based realm, to highlight how they've been addressing or approaching some of these challenges, in particular in relation to limited movement due to COVID-19, but really the initial kind of perception or idea behind this was a broader contribution to the field. How do we translate that evidence that individual programs are seeing so that others can learn from it? So these involve right now more of a, of a of a presentation style in a very quick video. They're less than four minutes, um, shared on YouTube and then out within the broader. But we are also working, particularly in GIS right now, on doing actual interviews and working with the implementers on what they're currently doing so they can share that out in their own words and be able to highlight how they, can, how they found um, appropriate resources, how they improved their capacity building on it. Just an example on GIS, we're working with a team in Nigeria right now who's using um, free GIS services to track uh, crop issues so they can work on food distribution in particularly in the Central Valley where, we, Valley where we have more of a herder and pastoralist and farmer kind of conflict going on. So that's an example of something where we'll work with the team to actually video them and have them putting the input on what's going on. And here are some of the key resources that they use in order to increase their GIS capacity and skill as well as the actual software and how they use it. So I'm gonna leave it there. I think I'm just about a little around 20 minutes. Um, very happy to answer any questions about some of these. And then of course, any other questions on, on you know, interreligious engagement, Merle, et cetera, and what we've been doing in that realm. Thank you, Olivia. Great, thank you so much, Jessica. Um, perfect timing. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is um, pass it over to questions for the group. Um, I'd ask you to raise your hand um, using the hand raise function in, um, in the participants section. Um, or if you um, would like me to read your question out, please put it in the chat um, and I can read it out as well. So we're open for question and answers now. Um, in the meantime, I think Jessica and I might put some links in the chat. So the first link that I'm going to put in is the link to the case study form. Um, and my email address um, so you can get in touch with me if you have ideas and we can see how to um, um, get something together and how we can support you in that. Um, and then um, Jessica um, mentioned um, the links to the um, Faith Matters guide um, and also um, probably to create creativity in crisis links so there might be some coming through there. Um, okay, so um, over to the group for any questions. Oh, Go ahead, um, May, I see you've unmuted, and Sarah, so um, May, if you have a question, please go ahead. No, oh, no, <laughs> Sarah, please go ahead. Okay, I can't hear Sarah. We'll maybe come back. Um, Nathan, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Jessica, uh, for the presentation. Um, Nathan Maloney with Living Water International. Um, I was kind of curious. I was taking a quick look at the Faith Matters guide and just, you know, really impressive collection of guides and resources uh, that you all have put together. So kudos on that. Um, I was just kind of curious if you could go into a little bit more detail, I guess, of, of who uh, the target audience for those uh, documents would be or those guides would be. Um, and just kind of thinking about, you know, some of the conversations within this group, you know, really trying to understand the different uh, levels of what we mean by uh, local faith actors. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, have you seen this primarily being used with perhaps faith-based organizations or individual religious leaders, I guess. I'm kind of curious a little bit more on, on who's using the guides or, you know, how's it, or who's it being targeted to, maybe the, the best question. 
Great. Thank you so much, Nathan. That's a wonderful question. And I could say, you know, originally, I, I would argue, and I would definitely, Michelle, you have thoughts too on the Faith Matters Guide, but our mandate under EIEP is both secular and faith-based organizations and actors who either engage with faith actors through the course of their programming, or they themselves are faith actors doing perhaps maybe non-traditionally, maybe they see themselves as a faith actor and not necessarily a peace builder or peace builders who themselves don't see themselves as a faith actor, but engage with faith actors. So it has a diverse branching in that regard. Um, we've had a lot of feedback from a variety of individuals, both at organizational as well even at government levels who have interacted with the guide. Um, I was working with the Tony Blair Institute who was using this in their supporting leaders initiative that was working particularly with faith actors. Um, and then a lot of our other products, we've targeted both more, I would say, in terms of the actual implementing actors. That's really critical for myself as a mandate to make sure that what we're providing is accessible and practical and easy to use. So the peace building design and monitoring training or the PDM training is designed particularly for those who themselves engage in a faith-based setting, either secularly or faith-based themselves, but maybe have very foundational to no knowledge on peace building design, monitoring, and evaluation. So it really was designed in that sense for on the ground. Um, if you're doing this type of work, how can we help you think evaluatively and start to implement some of these basic components within your work? So that training to date has been done both at a very local level where I've worked um, with individual organizational field teams like Mercy Corps, the Carter Center, uh, Search for Common Ground, or I've also worked with faith actors themselves doing this type of work. Uh, we did a training in Bangkok, Thailand that brought individuals from Pakistan, Thailand, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, um, who themselves, many were faith actors who were working on peace building programming and were looking to you know, better understand some of these concepts within their own peace building efforts as a faith actor. Thank you, Jessica. Um, Uh, yes, any other questions? I, I would say that um, we're also um, opening this as a relatively free space as well. If you want to um, give any like updates on um, your own work at the moment. Um, our last call, we also talked about um, 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 COVID in relation to meal. And I think this is very pertinent, especially for the creativity in crisis series that um, Jessica is mentioning. So I don't know as well if there's any ideas um, that are coming to mind right now that you think might be interesting for that video series and the opportunity that presents um, to be able to put together, um, a, um, you know, with the support of AFP to have a video put together on um, um, one of the innovations that you're working with at the moment within your meal teams. Um, we wanted to bring this to you as a group, as an opportunity um, that would be of interest to the group. So, um, you know, it, it, even just um, initial ideas um, and sharing about any more of the innovations that are coming about around COVID um, would be, um, um, you know, very pertinent as well. So, um, Please go ahead. Um, we have a question from May in the chat. Just is there any informa information on the DNM training available online? May, thank you so much. And that's a great question. I'm excited to say in terms of this doesn't help anyone today, but AFP is launching their new website this Friday. And that does have more comprehensive information on the training, including agenda, um, contacts, and some of the basic topics and themes that are covered. What I'll make sure to do when I um, follow up with Olivia is on the posted video, I'll share the new links that include some of the ones that I shared on the side here that would be more up to date. Uh, but I would also encourage for any questions to please reach out to me. I put my email in the side box. It's just jessica at Alliance for Peace Building, all one word, sorry for that, <laughs> dot org. Um, but yes, would love to follow up with anyone. And then also we do have a wealth of other resources that came out of the EIAP program, including a meta evaluation on peace building, uh, interreligious peace building that'll be available on the new website. Uh, some other thought pieces in terms of the distinctions in relation to interreligious mel. Uh, so I do apologize. I don't have that right now, but I promise you it'll be available next week. And I'm really excited to unveil that. 
Jessica. And if there's any questions for me um, on the um, meal case study um, and what we're looking for in that, please let me know. Um, okay, um, we have Jean for a question. Jean. Hey everybody, thanks so much Jessica. That was a fantastic overview of a, of a plethora of tools and resources. The Irene database is, is uh, really impressive, over 3,000 indicators. Could you comment on the um, content relating to the distinctive attributes of faith-based uh, implementation and faith-based work within the database? Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Jean. Um, so the database was developed in more of a deduction method in the sense we allowed the resources to speak to us. We did not put specific research parameters on it. Um, in that case, because we really wanted this to be more of a holistic, um, more of a holistic approach rather than saying we want only PCVE outcomes or we want only violence reduction outcomes. What we can do, and, and I'm just gonna share my screen again, if that's all right. Um, a lot of the interreligious distinctions come out within the actual tags and within the actual programmatic approaches. So it really depends on what in particular to the interreligious sphere you would be interested in looking at. Now, one of the key components, as I said, a lot relates in with trust, um, a lot relates in with some of our area subgroups. But the great thing is that you could look at components like religion and look at them across any of those subcategories so that you're not just uh, limiting yourself to say this type of implementer. Or you could even, if there are specific implementing orgs that you wanted to look at who you know do specific types of programming in that, search in that regard. So it comes up a lot in terms of the tags. So I was just opening these back up and then into the specific community uh, target groups as well. So the database is pretty vast. Um, <laughs> and I'm probably, uh, my, uh, the individual who worked on the database with me is probably going to, to, when I tell her I went off script in the searching, right? Because you never know how many resources are gonna pop up, so it's fun. But just an example, I typed into tags religion just to see what was gonna start coming up. And, you know, in this one example, we're looking at quite a few different types of interfaith collaboration, holy sites, religious tolerance, uh, respect. We can see things that deal with religious freedom, um, different components in terms of national laws, relationship building, attitudes. So as you can see, there's a lot in here, and it really depends on what in particular within the concept of interreligious engagement or interreligious action or religious peace building, however we want to call it, you yourself want to narrow down to. And that can be across any of these. Like I said, not just tags, but something like if we really wanted to know about specific indicators that have, let me just clear that, um, that have potentially religion in them. How are people measuring anything in relation to in relation to religion, we can see if anything pops up. Society's willingness to adapt, religion, family, gender, importance of ethnicity and religion when choosing friendships, level of comfort with interactions with children of different ethnic groups or religion. So it really depends in terms of how your research or your thought focus is. Am I interested in specific types of programmatic approaches like um, violence reduction in relation to interreligious conflict? Am I interested in ways individuals are measuring willingness to you know, um, engage with individuals of another religion? Am I looking at something more broader like tolerance? Or am I looking at specific approaches uh, or um, sorry, activities such as um, interreligious engagement or community development, or just that someone targeted a religious leader or a community uh, based upon religious affiliation? So there's lots of flexibility there. Um, when I share, well, as I said, I've already shared the link for the database, which you're happy to, and, and I would encourage you to actually play within. But on the new website, we also have a instructional video. It's about 20 minutes on different ways to interact and engage with it in case uh, individuals are not as comfortable in Excel. And we're looking to, as part of our Creativity in Crisis series, also release one or two user kind of friendly 
short videos on different ways you could start to, to look at the database or use the database in your own work. Well, it's such a wealth of information. It's really amazing. Um, and I think that we all feel that we have quite a lot to look through there potentially um, and see what else is happening um, and what indicators are familiar and what um, indicators are new um, and just the, the ability to have that all in one place and shared in one place um, is, is amazing. Um, so um, I think that um, unless we have any other questions, um, any other questions for Jessica, particularly on the... I have a, I have a question. Oh, um, yeah, Jessica, hi, this is Kirsten Muth um, at JLI. This is fantastic, quite an incredible um, body of work, and especially the, the way you've created access to tools and the whole concept of um, helping to share really useful indicators. As, as all of us work on creating um, tools and, and things for people to use, one of the things I'm interested in is how how do you promote sort of the uptake in the in the use of the database? Um, in other words, you've, you've you you talked about you had nine trainings, um, international trainings. So obviously, those people went and did something. How do you kind of promote the the ongoing engagement with your database, with the people that you've trained, the learning, sort of the interface between um, continuing to build the community? Um, and to build the capacity of the community. How do you monitor what the uptake is for this kind of a resource? That is such a great question. I think it's a struggle we all encounter with the documents and tools and resources we put out. Um, it I'll be totally honest with you. It really depends on the resource and it depends on our ability to continue that level of engagement. So as an example, in the EIAP program, we have more of a sustained or formative training approach. So those nine trainings involved five days in person, but we also do a peer learning community with participants from those trainings that involve more sustained learning. So there are different approaches. Some of them are refresher courses where we, you know, they come to me with a specific topic that they're struggling with and would like to kind of one up on that again. But we also have individual peer-led learning where individuals throw out a problem that they're encountering and want to do a problem-solving session where they're like, hey, this was a serious issue for us when we started, I don't know, doing this type of survey data collection or this type of key informant interview, whatever it may be, in this environment we found, you know, very poor uptake or couldn't get access to individuals or X, Y, Z. And their peers can also provide options or ways that they've encountered or engaged a similar situation. So those are less, uh, more hands off, I would say for me. I, I really like them to work as a group more. And then one of the kind of, uh, I would say most intensive ways that we've developed in the form of training is working one-on-one -on -one with organizations for a longer period of time. So as an example, I've been working with Tannenbaum uh, Foundation on their um, Peacemakers in Action Network where they really yeah. struggled to get in, in-depth information. Their overall goal was that by empowering individual peacemakers and putting them in the PIA program and through small limited funding, that they themselves would be turned to as a knowledgeable individual and religion or religious actors engagement would increase in more formal levels. But they didn't really know how to track that. So I've been working with them internally for about a year now on developing both their M&E plan but also trying out and testing different types of tools within their network that could help them get that type of engagement level tracking. So we've really approached it in a variety of ways. I'd say our most hands-off is through more of our shared learning and convening opportunities where like the solutions forum, we encourage the field to come together and share themselves what they're learning and what they've struggled with. Um, obviously it's hard to encourage people to share failures. That, that's difficult in any situation. Um, but we've hosted events like a fail fest where, you know, lar I would, <laughs> I would say um, we particularly targeted senior level evaluators and researchers to share failures they've run into with individuals in a humorous, uh, informal way, which was great. It was after hours. But so we've looked at a variety of ways like that. Um, in terms of Irene, it's a great question. And we've actually really struggled because obviously beyond basic output measures, like how many people visit the page, how many people have downloaded it, we do have a feedback section. And through our release events, we do occasionally circulate feedback. 
um, forms that we send to participants to say, could you share with us ways in which you are engaging or ways that this has been useful to you? Um, we're hopeful, as I said, as we are embarking on more of a digitization of it, that more metadata would provide us more information in terms of some of the initial questions like frequency of use of certain indicators. And again, I highlight very strongly, frequency does not equate quality. <laughs> <laughs> but to start us understanding where people are participating and giving them that direct option for feedback. So those are just a couple of the ways that we've kind of played with engagement, um, but it's not easy. I just want to be clear there because we yeah. send these resources out into the world. And I think from my personal experience, as I said, one of the most successful has been sustained engagement, which requires quite a level of effort that I would say most organizations just to be honest, probably don't have the capacity to do. But the peer learning and, and that type of sustained engagement has really been more successful to us. Um, does that mean that, I think this is the question each organization has to understand too, is the goal of your tools and outputs to affect the most amount of people or to really work and improve and go deep? And that is definitely an organizational decision that I, you know, I, I couldn't make for others. But through at least the EIEP program, a lot of our work has been focused more on going deep. How do we really work with? Um, we did initially anticipate having a mentorship program associated with those who participated in the training, those initial nine trainings, having them then become like a TOT and train others through a mentorship of it. To be honest with you, most of the participants did not feel capable of doing that. And we decided that instead of putting them on the spot and being like, teach out, it was better to have more sustained engagement with those participants and really feel that they were able to integrate this within their own work. Okay, okay, thank you, that's helpful. That was a lot, sorry. It's a real question and something we're struggling with too. Yeah, no, it is um, a lot of food for thought, yeah. Interesting to hear the thought process as well, Jessica. And I think the mentorship idea is really interesting, um, uh, you know, as we link it to ideas around localization and other points. Um, I, I mean, we have a few minutes, we do have a few minutes left um, if there are any more questions. Um, also, please, um, if there are any questions for me about the, the case study compendium for those of you who are new on the call, um, please let me know. Okay, um, I'm open to it. To any questions and um, but otherwise we'll, we'll finish up. Olivia I do have a question and I apologize I can't find the icon right now for raising my hand but <laughs> do yourself. Ahead, Michelle. <laughs> Um, it's a question about mutual learning and kind of a reflection on what we talked about earlier in the conversation about the fact that uh, part of the beauty and power of what Alliance for Peacebuilding does uh, on interreligious peace building is uh, bringing faith-based actors and secular actors who are involved in working with religious partners together. Um, I know as one of the authors of the Faith Matters Guide, that was uh, our biggest challenge, having such a wide and diverse audience, but it was also a huge rich source of mutual cross-learning between all those different communities of experience and practice. And it's something that we've talked about um, in this group as well. For example, when we were putting together our call for case studies and wanting to really cultivate case studies that illustrated mutuality of learning, you know, not just what are the local faith actors learning from us, <laughs> but what are they bringing uh, to the table and what are we learning from them? So uh, it's just a wide open question for Jessica, however she wants to respond, but I'm curious, even as AFP has been providing such amazing learning resources for faith-based actors in interreligious action, um, what at the same time do you think AFP has been learning from those faith-based and interreligious actors? Thank you so much, Michelle. That definitely is a very broad conversation <laughs> in a great way. Um, I have to be honest with you, as, as an evaluator who, you know, is trained as an economist coming into interreligious evaluation. I, I think one of the biggest components for me that this has um, really highlighted in terms of what is AFP learned, 
I think one for me has been coming to people where they are and really respecting the fact that I know I joked in the beginning about language, but I think this is a huge, huge lacuna within the Emony field that we in and of ourselves, no matter what language we speak, speak our own language. And trying to translate that more broadly is, is a struggle. Um, I think also really respecting, and, and this is very personal, but I would say this, this translates to AFP as well, has really been stepping back and recognizing that the process is not only just as important, but sometimes more important than the results. So spending time to really invest in understanding that process, because coming at the same tool or technique or even indicator is not, just because you end up with the same thing does not mean that you all got there in the same way. So I think that has been something that we've really worked on, you know, improving our listening in some regards, but also really making that space for that process. Because as, as Michelle said, I mean, the idea of like, of course, if everyone's working with faith actors, whether you're a faith actor or not, this should be easy. But I always joke that the EIP program, it took like a year for them to come up with the name because even knowing what to call this was complicated. So I, I do think that one of the values of, of MEL within this space is that it does provide a shared language, even though people come at it from different ways, um, but definitely making room for the process, being able and willing to listen, but then I think really trying to, to bolster people up, both in terms of how do we receive information up and how do we push information down, because those are two different routes to get to the same kind of shared results and we have found we want to really pull information up more um, and we see this a lot within our COVID-19 work and looking at faith actors what we learn from faith actors in Ebola and SARS and Zika um, and how we can try and really use that on the ground knowledge um, to make sure that that's informing not that we're just telling so I know that that wasn't necessarily a very <laughs> concise, um, concise response, but it, it definitely, those have been some of both the joys and some of the, the difficulties <laughs> and challenges within this space. Yeah, it's great. So many good insights. And I think they're really insights that will resonate with our group. So thanks. Put you on the spot to think. <laughs> <laughs> to reflect. No, no, it's great. Um, so we, I see we have one last question from Kamina on the chat. So let's just go. Um, um, thank you very much um, for the question, um, which I think is great about how can we um, think about the process of cultivating data culture among local faith actors. So perhaps some of these groups that you've been talking about that whether, you know, there isn't an existing um, um, m and &E framework that's familiar to the group. Um, um, what are some of the drivers of success? Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest things that I really believe is empowering individuals to know that we all are evaluators at heart. Um, we often do a, like a cookie exercise in the beginning, or I change that to a local dessert or something where individuals have to talk about things they like or don't like in that topic. And really within faith factors as well, the particularly, I would say, religious leaders they themselves make informed data-driven decisions all the time. I think that they are obviously influenced by faith, but I don't think that's different from most individuals, whether it's faith or a value system or morality. So really trying to empower individuals to recognize their own expertise and then finding systems that align with that. So as a random example, working on data collection techniques with um, transient Fulani individuals in West Africa, it doesn't make sense for me to give them a location where I'm going to collect data every eight months. That doesn't align with maybe their transport paths or the way they move around. So what we ended up doing in that example was sewing in GIS trackers into their, their camel um, saddles so that we could track their routes and then find the most commonly located places. Um, it's adapting a system to individuals who themselves are already doing that work. Finding a good approach that aligns is not enforced, and I think empowering individuals to recognize what they're already doing and how do we both highlight that, but then in, if possible, enhance it. If not, find ways to, to really share that. I think everyone um, has a lot of this knowledge. It's trying to teach them how to systematically and methodically capture it in a way that aligns with what they do. 
Thanks, Jessica. I love that. We're all evaluators and it needs to be aligned, not enforced. Those are some, I think these are some good messages to end on, in fact. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining today. Um, the last thing I'll say is that um, we'll meet again. Um, we're now bi-monthly. Um, Dan Williams, who's um, from Hope International, who's our usual co-chair, sends his apologies for today, um, but he'll be back with us next time. Um, we, um, as always, we're um, you know, open to um, any suggestions you may have, um, please let me know. And um, also, if you would like to bring uh, one of your um, examples um, from your organization to this conversation, um, you're also very welcome to um, present, be one of the next presenters. Um, and so we look forward to hearing from you in the next sessions. Um, so that's all from us for now. Um, thank you very much to um, Jessica. Um, there's a lot to go and reflect on now. I'm sure we'll all be looking through the database um, immediately. Um, and um, great to see you all today. So thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Thank you all so much.